Um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to this, our University of Law alumni speaker event, which is an evening with Joshua Rosenberg. So my name's uh, Jill Howe Williams, and I'm the Dean at the University of Law, and I'm absolutely honoured to be talking to Joshua uh, this evening. Um, so Joshua will be sharing his thoughts with us for about... 50 minutes, and then we will have a brief Q&A session at the end. And I really hope that you enjoy tonight's event as much as I know I will. I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, Joshua's hugely successful career as Britain's best-known commentator um, on the law. Uh, his achievements are quite exceptional, and therefore, without, I hope, embarrassing Joshua too much, I will, uh, by way of introduction, mention a few of them. So first of all, Joshua is the only full-time journalist to have been appointed um, a, as Queen's Counsel Honoris Causa. Um, he's also an honorary master of the bench of um, Gray's Inn and a non-executive board member of the Law Commission. Joshua's career in law started when he graduated with his law degree from Wadham College, Oxford. And from there, he studied the Law Society finals with the College of Law, as it then was known, and went on to qualify as a solicitor in the 1970s with a very broad practice area covering uh, crime, family, divorce, conveyancing, and other legal aid type work. Um, his career in journalism, which is probably best known, started um, at the BBC in uh, 1975, and he was the BBC's legal correspondent for 15 years and introduced the regular feature Law in Action, which is um, still broadcast today. So now he is a freelance journalist. As I'm sure you all know, he writes regularly for The Guardian and the Law Society Gazette. And he holds honorary doctorates in law from the universities of Hertfordshire, Nottingham Trent, Lincoln, and indeed our own university, the University of Law. He's also managed to fit in um, the authoring of several books, include, including most recently, um, Enemies of the People, how Judges Shape Society. Joshua is known for his independence, his authority, and his ability to explain complicated legal issues with simplicity, clarity, and um, wit. And he was included by the Times in its independently judged list of the UK's 100 most influential lawyers, the only journalist to feature on this list. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Joshua tonight to this event. Thank you, Jeff. Nothing, nothing left to say, really, is there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think we'll find something for you to say. So I'm going to start off with, I hope, an easy question, which is really just to get you to start at the beginning of your um, career and to think back to what inspired you, what was the initial spark that made you want to um, study law in the first place when you went to university? Well, I hadn't done badly at law at school, um, which was unusual. Um, uh, I say unusual because I'd done badly at everything else, but I hadn't <laughs> studied law at school, so um, there was no problem about that. Um, it, it, seemed a, it seemed an interesting subject. It seemed a practical subject to do. Um, I could see it leading to a career in the law. I was wrong about that, as with many things. But um, it, just seemed, um, it just seemed something that would interest me. I'd done, I'd done um, part of an A-level in what was called British Constitution. Um, and and I, I found that very interesting. The, the rest of it was economics, which I couldn't follow. But the British Constitution, how the country worked, I did find interesting. And I found myself, before going to university, working in various solicitors' firms in London during school holidays and things like that. And so it seemed a natural progression. Now, you went on from Oxford to study your Law Society finals with, um, with us. It must have been a little bit of a, a change. Um, so um, can you recall any sort of particular favourite memories of studying the Law Society finals and, uh, in particular, any um, sort of assessment experiences that you'd like to share with the audience? Um, no, it was, it was, it was you know, not the worst period of my life. That, that was... Um, <laughs> that was that was, that was to come, but it was, it was the second worst period of my life. Um, the, the College of Law, um, the London branch anyway, was in a large old house on many levels in a place called Lancaster Gate between um, uh, Notting Hill Gate and, and the West End. Um, and you had hard wooden chairs, which were too small, and um, hard wooden tables, uh, which wobbled. Um, and the teaching method consisted of uh, lecturers who would dictate at 
just a tiny bit faster than dictation speed, the, the speed at which you could write down um, anything. You would have to write down every word they said verbatim in longhand and then memorise it that night. I just couldn't do it. I mean, I had no trouble getting a law degree, um, but actually, you know, coping with that sort of teaching, having had, you know, a reasonably intellectual three years at Oxford, um, I found very, very difficult. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't a happy time. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, and I hope that the alumni here tonight had, have had a, 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 a better experience mm. at, the, at the University of London. I'm sure it's changed a lot. We certainly don't have hard wooden seats anymore. No, They've it, definitely it, got it, soft pads. No. <laughs> no, it was, uh... um, so um, you then went on um, from um, the College of Law uh, to do your articles yes. at um, the solicitor's firm Dixon, Dixon Ward. Yes. So can you um, share some of your experiences as an article clerk um, racing around London and, yes. and, and what sort of work you were involved uh, I, with? I mean, it seems strange now, doesn't it? But, you know, in those days, a, a firm in a prosperous part of London could not only do legal aid but crime. Um, and so I would regularly visit clients in Brixton Prison, where I happened to be last week for something completely different. Um, I would, um, <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, just for an hour or two, you understand, um, <laughs> listen to Tomorrow's Law in Action to find out. Um, and um, I, we would do um, domestic violence. That was quite a new thing. I used to have to issue a divorce petition uh, before you could get an injunction. And I used to write out divorce petitions by hand, and we had counsel who was very good at getting them urgently issued, and, and so on. Um, conveyancing, probate, um, uh, drawing up wills. I was rather, I was slightly alarmed when somebody came in, drew up a will, and then promptly um, killed herself, I'm afraid. Um, she wanted to um, leave um, uh, all her money to a, a man she slightly coyly described as her nephew. Um, and indeed she did. I hadn't quite realised what was going on there. Um, I realised how important it is not to be nice to clients when they say they haven't got quite enough money to pay on account, and I was too generous to them, and they uh, did a run owing as much as five pounds, I think it was, in those days. You know, it was a great deal of money. Um, and uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a jolly time. It was a very nice firm in the, uh, on Richmond Green, a very um, jolly couple of years. Um, and then you applied to join the BBC in 1979, yes. which yeah. is a, a pretty fundamental career yes. change from that was. Um, that... your previous experience yeah. um, at uh, Dixon yeah. Ward. So what was the main driver behind um, that change? Uh, it, was, it was a whim, really. Um, you know, I thought, <laughs> I mean, the, the story which I've told many times, it's perfectly true. We had some friends who were working. Uh, what, we had some friends. One of them was working at the BBC as a secretary. She was working in the appointments department. And she told my wife, who was then training to be a journalist, has now managed to qualify as a journalist, if you can qualify as a journalist. Um, she told my wife that the BBC had a training scheme for journalists. Um, and um, uh, she said to my wife, did she, my wife, want to apply? And my wife was then on a newspaper training scheme, um, as newspapers had in those days. And my wife said, no, she didn't want to apply uh, to the BBC. She was quite happy in newspapers. And somebody, and I, I think it was my wife rather than these friends of ours, said to me, why don't you apply? And, you know, I watched my wife's training course from afar, not literally, but I'd watch what she was doing. And I thought it sounded rather fun. And the BBC training scheme said, candidates will be required to take a voice test, which sounded rather glamorous in a strange way. Um, and I applied to the BBC scheme, um, as I say, on a whim. And um, they, um, I was shortlisted on the basis they didn't have many trainee solicitors who were applying. Um, and um, after being interviewed and after the voice test, um, I was offered a place. Um, and then what should I do? You know, um, I was perfectly happy being a trainee solicitor. Um, and I expect I would have qualified in due course, as indeed I did. Um, and, uh, but um, if I stayed being a solicitor, I, my future was fairly clear as to what was to happen. If I joined the BBC as a trainee journalist, I had absolutely no idea what would happen to me. Um, and I, I take the view that one should always take opportunities when they come along. Um, and I did. Um, 
because otherwise you kick yourself. You say, what would have happened if I'd done this? Um, and so I had to take the offer in order to find out what would happen to me. Um, and I did. Um, and I gave him my notice. And I've stayed at the BBC for 25 years. Yeah. And what aspect of um, working for the BBC did you enjoy most at that sort of initial stage? Well, we, um, we were trainees and uh, we made dummy programmes. We made a radio programme every day um, as if it was real. And that meant um, going out to news stories, um, just like real journalists, uh, and uh, covering them. And to our surprise, because we regarded ourselves as, as trainees rather than as qualified, not that that means very much in journalism, but we certainly didn't have the experience. But much to our surprise, we tended to get to the scene of the crime, and it often was a crime, but wherever it was, before the real reporters working for the BBC newsroom. Um, and occasionally, if we were the first there, we would get interviewed by real radio programmes. We would actually broadcast. And that was terribly exciting. Um, and, you know, we, we realised, we, we learnt a lot about journalism. I learnt a lot from a friend of mine who still works for the BBC, who had spent six months working on a local radio station and had picked up some of the skills of radio um, before becoming a trainee. Um, but we had a fascinating time doing our dummy programmes and, and broadcasting and interviewing and... And um, it was great. And, you know, you learnt on the job. It was super. And, and if you made a mistake, it wasn't generally broadcast. And if it was broadcast, then it wasn't a mistake. And um, obviously from, from that start, you launched the famous Law in Action um, yes. series. So yes. what, what was the sort of spark behind that? What made you develop well, that feature? It, it's curious. Um, I think there was somebody very senior at the BBC at the time possibly the chairman, a man called George Howard of Castle Howard. Um, and I think he said to somebody on high, um, what are we doing about law? Um, and of course, um, the one answer you don't give the chairman of the BBC is nothing. Um, and so somebody, I imagine, said, oh yes, yes, we've got that Rosenberg chap, he's trained as a lawyer, and he's going to launch a radio series, and he's going to be uh, standing in as legal correspondent, and so on. I, I, I speculate, I don't know. All I know is that um, in about 1984, the BBC decided that it wanted to do, um, uh, it wanted to devote more resources to specialist coverage of law. You have to remember that before that period, I say remember, you're too young to remember, but I mean, you have to know that before that period, um, they didn't have many specialist correspondents, certainly not in law, which was considered rather an obscure subject. The view was taken, certainly in television, um, that if you had specialists, they might know too much about the subject. And it was much better if you had a generalist who could come in in the morning knowing nothing about the story, pick up enough uh, during the day and broadcast in the evening, because if that individual could understand it, then it followed that the audience could understand it. Total fallacy, but that was the way they thought. And, um, and so they decided that they would try me out as legal affairs reporter. At the same time, they launched Law in Action, which was a current affairs program on Radio 4. Um, I had tried to launch that program a couple of years earlier, when I had been a BBC producer, but by then I'd switched to being a reporter. Um, great shift. The reporters have all the fun, uh, the producers have all the money. They, they rise to become editors and bosses and in charge, and we're the people who do the broadcasting, and we have the fun, but not the funds. Um, and um, we, uh, uh, we launched this program to see what would happen. Um, I was tried out as legal affairs reporter. It so happened uh, that the National Union of Mine Workers won strike in the winter of 84, 85. Um, and the, this was a, a striking against the Thatcher government. And the success or otherwise of the strike had a great deal to do with the law. All sorts of strange creatures descended from the gods, like sequestrators who were there to seize the miners' assets. Um, and the official solicitor who was there to rescue Arthur Scargill, the mine workers' leader, from going to prison for contempt. Um, and uh, all, there were lots and lots of legal issues involved. Um, and these were terribly important legal issues because this was, a, you know, this was the mine workers against the government. Um, and as far as the government was concerned, it, you know, it didn't want to be defeated. So these were important issues, along with the industrial relations coverage, another area which isn't covered these days. Law was really important. Anyway, they thought I was doing okay. They decided to confirm the appointment after 
a probationary period of six months, and then the mine worker strike ended, and um, that was the end of that. But I carried on doing legal affairs, found things to do. And, and in that um, series, um, obviously the, the minor strike was, was hugely important, yes. but what would you say were the other um, programmes from that series that were your, sort of your greatest achievements, well, where you really got under the sort of skim of what was go, going hard, on? It's hard to say. I mean, we did, I did that programme for only three years at that time, from 84 to 87. And what I particularly remember was the efforts we went to to get judges on the air, because in those days, judges wouldn't broadcast. Um, and I remember travelling to Manchester with Lord Wolfe, as he later became, um, where he was going to deliver a lecture, a Harry Street Memorial Lecture. Um, and I knew him, and I saw him on the train, and I chatted to him. Um, and, um, you know, the normal way of dealing with his lecture for a Radio 4 audience would have been to record a short interview with him about the main points of what he was saying. And he was perfectly friendly, and, and still is. But he couldn't give me an interview, as the rules then stood, as it was seen in those days. So I had to go along and put the microphone of my tape recorder in front of him as he sat on the platform to deliver the lecture, to just to record his voice, just to get the voice of a judge on the radio. Um, and um, I remember Rose Heilbronn, who was the second woman to become a High Court judge, um, uh, laying the foundation stone of what's called, I think, the Atkin Building at Gray's Inn um, at that time. Um, and she, you know, declared the foundation stone duly laid, or whatever you do when you lay a foundation stone. And I held out my tape recorder, microphone, just to hear her voice saying, you know, I hereby lay this stone. And we went to these extraordinary lengths um, just to get to hear judges, because that was such an extraordinary thing. Now, it's much easier. Not extremely easy, but it's still it's much easier. And we just tried to do that pioneering thing. I also remember, remember interviewing uh, lawyers, particularly, who had never been interviewed before. And one who uh, later made it to the Court of Appeal um, said that he was then a barrister. He said that the prospect of being interviewed by me was worse than going to the dentist. And I said, you know, but you are fearless. You stand up in the High Court, in the Court of Appeal, in the House of Lords, uh, you know, your advocacy is superb, you appear to be totally in control, and he said, of course, it's what you're used to. Um, and what he was not used to was being interviewed. And people would be interviewed, and they couldn't quite tell, they couldn't quite understand why the words that came out of their mouths were not as polished and as smooth and as, as, and as articulate as the words that came out of the radio when other people were speaking. And what they had no idea about was how much effort we put into editing the interviews, which is very easy in radio, harder on television, in order to make them sound articulate, and the various effort we went to to make people sound clear and simple. Um, and they were fine, you know, once they were edited, um, but it took a bit of work. So... Moving on just briefly from, from the BBC for a moment, um, you moved into printed um, yes. journalism yes. and you joined the, um, Telegraph. the Telegraph and then subsequently mm. um, yeah. the Guardian. Yeah. So what were the sort of um, the key changes that you um, made to sort of adjust to that? Yeah. What, what, how did that sort of it, differ from... It, it, it was quite being... shocking, really, because um, I joined the Telegraph in 2000 um, the editor offered me a job, he offered me more money. Um, the, um, uh, in, if you work in television, at least you did in those days, you used to think newspapers were serious journalism, just as if you worked in newspapers, you used to think that television was the place to be. But having set this principle 25 years earlier, which is that you take offers when they come along, um, and Charles Moore, the editor of The Telegraph, said, you know, come and work for me, um, I thought, take the opportunity when it comes. That was probably a career mistake. Um, when I got to the Telegraph, it was rather surprising. Um, people had to share computers. Um, I mean, this was 19 years ago, but even so, um, if you think about it, the BBC website started in 1997. Um, so I, I was you know, entirely familiar with um, online research for news and other things. Um, and the idea 
uh, that some people didn't have computer access to the internet and they had to share terminals uh, was rather disturbing. The, the Telegraph was very underfunded. If you're wondering how the newspaper was produced, they had a, a very, very ancient computerized system unique to newspapers uh, with its own set of terminals, um, which every so often would crash and the word would go around the, the newsroom, save your copy, because the system was running slowly and the, you know, everything was about to disappear off the screen. So you would press save and hope that it saved and then would be rebooted. Um, and when this um, system failed, as it often did, spare parts apparently had to be obtained from an obscure newspaper in Africa, which was the only country left in the world that still used this ancient system. It was extraordinary. <laughs> Um, so it was a bit of a culture shock um, doing this. Um, but, um, uh, but it was also quite interesting. I mean, I, um, I, uh, I, I offered to join the paper a day earlier than I was scheduled to arrive because there was a, a very strong story that day. And I, I asked if they wanted me to cover it, and they first of all said no, and then they secondly said yes. Um, and... Um, so the first day I was officially working for them, I had what's called the splash, which means the front page lead story, the main story on the front page, which is a very good way to annoy all your future colleagues, you know. <laughs> um, and, um, and I was writing this, as it happens, I was writing it from France because this was a man called David Shaler who was returning to face the music in London. Um, he was a former MI5 agent who was... Uh, uh, wanted and he decided to return and I was writing this story about him returning um, and I was amazed that the newspaper seemed to be trusting me with this important story um, on my first day effectively working for them and what I didn't realize is how much in newspapers um, somebody on the news desk can rewrite your copy and take in the agency stuff and put in what they want and make it sound right and look right um, you can't really do that in broadcasting because in broadcasting, if it's live, you're speaking, they're listening, nobody can stop you. If it's recorded, it's different, but if it's live, it's down to you. So I was surprised at how much latitude I got, um, but that's, how, that's the great difference between newspapers and, and, and broadcasting. And, and interestingly, I mean, to move from The Telegraph to The Guardian, which obviously have uh, are the two ends of the political <sighs> spectrum, yes. did you, you ever feel because of your sort of your independent voice um, in any way, not necessarily compromised, but pushed into a position where you were having to put your commentary with a particular spin that reflected the complexion of that paper, or did you always keep your, your sort of no, independence? No, it, it was fine at The Guardian. Um, the problem was The Telegraph, um, because, um, you know, when I left, or at the time I left, um, it was a slow departure from The Telegraph. I started... Um, to begin with, I gave up being their legal editor, but I carried on writing a column for them, um, and then that went as well. But the t what made me uh, resign from being their legal editor was what you've just alluded to. Um, there was a particular story in the Telegraph. There was a particular story that day. It was a decision of the law lords. Um, and um, it was... Uh, uh, it was a case involving some soldiers, and they won their case. And the news desk said, you know, you've said that the soldiers have got a declaration in their favour. Um, are they going to get compensation? And I said, no, they've got a declaration in their favour, but they're not going to get any money. And the news desk said, it would be a much better story if they got compensation. I said, it would be a better story if they got compensation, <laughs> but that's not what happened. Um, and then they said... The Evening Standard said that today, says today uh, that these soldiers could get compensation. And I said, well, you know, there's a lot in the word could, but, you know, my story is that they've won, but they're not going to get compensation. And then the news desk said, well, maybe you could do a joint story with yourself and the defence correspondent and see if there's another way you could write it. And, I, and the defence correspondent said, well, what's going to happen to these soldiers? Will they get compensation? The answer is no. So, you know, the story didn't change. And then when it appeared the next day, the story that was published said soldiers could get compensation. And this was picked up by one of the judges in the case who said that my analysis on the inside page was fine. This was a column, lengthy column, but the story on the front page was inaccurate. And I said, yep, it was inaccurate. 
and that's when I felt I had to leave the Telegraph. Mm -hmm. The Guardian, I was never on the staff, but when I, um, when I left the Telegraph, the Guardian was looking for a legal column. Um, and so I simply wrote a column for them every week uh, for not very much money until the Guardian ran out of money and they said they simply couldn't afford me. Um, the Guardian, you know, has got slightly better, but it was in very dire straits when I left them. And that was that. I went down to one a, one a fortnight instead of once a week, and, and then they said, we can't even afford that. And they weren't paying very much. I mean, it's extraordinary, really. Um, so um, that all stopped. Um, newspapers are in a bad way. Well, that um, segues beautifully to my next question, uh, which is really, um, as well as the, the, the financial pressures, and perhaps we can sort of come back to that, what do you think are the greatest challenges that the, that the printed press um, faces at the moment and, and what do you think are the, the, the consequences for the consumer of the consumers of news as a result of these challenges? And the problem is that the consumers of news are not generally speaking willing to pay uh, for the news that they consume. Um, so they don't buy newspapers on the whole. Um, they don't particularly subscribe to newspapers that are behind paywalls. They look at advertising but that's not really enough. Um, and newspapers cost a lot of money to produce. And the fewer people who read them and buy them, effectively the more they cost to produce. Um, and that's not helped by huge investments in, in um, printing presses, as The Guardian did, in you know, what was short-sighted but understandable, um, but a terrible mistake, you know, huge amounts of, of money wasted. Um, so it's very difficult to carry on with newspapers unless you've got somebody prepared to subsidize them through other means. Um, and uh, they are having to compete. Um, they um, are having to cut costs. Um, and it's a tricky situation. We rely on them. You know, we, we, we trust them. We hope that they will um, provide us with the information that we need but they are having to do so with fewer and fewer resources, less and less money, um, and that's because people no longer read newspapers in the way they did. People no longer commute. I mean, possibly here to the city, people still arrive on trains in the morning, but nobody reads a newspaper, as they would have 20 years ago, and if they do, it might be a free sheet. Um, so uh, it's all changed. Um, you know, news has changed a great deal. Um, you know, we all know what we look at um, if we look at anything on the train, um, and that's the phone you've got sitting there and I've got in my pocket here. Um, I mentioned in my introduction that you've also written a number of, of books, and, um, and um, from, from reading um, some of these works, there seems to be a, a common theme, and I don't know if the audience has read um, any of Joshua's books. If you haven't, I really recommend that you you do they are excellent but um the theme that came across to me was um how often you have written about topics that after you have written about them have become the sort of the hot topic of the day <laughs> so they seem very prescient so so so, so first of all i want to know where you hide your crystal ball to be able to spot <laughs> these hot topics but yes just to really sort of get behind how um with your books on say for example constitutional hmm. reform um, and privacy in the press, which you wrote well before the Millie Dowler and sort of Leveson inquiry, but clearly brings up a lot of the themes that you cover in your book. How did you manage to identify what clearly have become, I think, some of the biggest issues of, of the day? What, what, what were your connections? What were your thought processes in yeah. putting together your books? Um, I, I think the only answer I can give is that I write about current affairs. Um, and although books have an extraordinary six-month time lag between completion and publication uh, on the whole, um, they may still be current at the time they're published. I certainly uh, don't claim to be prescient. Um, I mean, the, my next book, which is not due out until April, um, but I've got the page proofs today, and, and certainly uh, I finished the, uh, the writing of it, um, it was meant to be finished on the 1st of September. I managed to extend that long enough to get the prorogation case in, the uh, Miller Number no. 2 and Cherry case in the Supreme Court. 
um, but it's only squeezed in in a couple of places to make it look as up to date as possible. Um, and um, you know, maybe those issues will still be current by next spring. Maybe they won't be. Um, I th- the, the privacy in the press book um, was very good luck because um, I wrote it just at the time that the cases were developing and before the issue settled down a bit. Um, so it remained reasonably current for a while. I suppose it still is reasonably current. There was a period um, uh, shortly... I mean, bef- the privacy law was being developed before the Human Rights Act came into effect, but it was given a big boost by the Human Rights Act. Um, obviously, that took effect in 2000. Um, and um, the book, I think, was completed in 2003, 2004. There was an update and so on, and finally sort of out in 2005. And uh, it was at that point that the law had, had said we had a privacy law. One had been created, and, and we still do, and it, it's still there. Um, so, you know, it is luck. Um, I, you know, one, in one of my books, um, I said what a good idea it would be to abolish the system under which the Lord Chancellor was the executive, the legislature and the judiciary all rolled into one. Um, and that, that happened. I'm not so sure it's quite such a good idea. Having seen it happen, I now begin to think that there was some advantage in the old system, but it couldn't be retained. Um, so, you know, my books tend to be what's going on at the moment and what interests me um, and uh, what, I, what I write down. Um, yes, and, and, and clearly your writing shows your, your passion and interest for constitutional law and, mm. and, and reform, mm. um, which again has, has proved to be <laughs> probably the hottest topic mm. um, of the last sort of mm. three, three years. Mm. So from your sort of experience and your connection um, with writing about constitutional law, what do you... Um, think about the constitution at the moment, how well is it performing um, with the challenges from, from Brexit, from prorogation, um, the independence of the judiciary and so on and so forth? Um, well, it, it, it's certainly under strain. Um, um, and um, I mean, the book that is coming out next spring is called Enemies of the People with a question mark. Um, and that, of course, relates to the first Miller judgment and the criticism of the High Court, the Divisional Court's decision by the Daily Mail, which used that headline to um, refer to the three judges who found that legislation was required to trigger Brexit. Um, When we had the unanimous decision of the Supreme Court, there was some criticism of the judiciary, but it was much more muted. I quote um, a government minister um, who was muttering, Uh, aggressively against the judges, no doubt with the encouragement of Downing Street. But it wasn't anything like as bad as it was three years ago. Um, But um, Lord Sumption in his Reef Lectures this year said that if the courts um, appear to be too political, then there will be pressure for vetting of potential judges. And indeed, when we got the decision of the Supreme Court, there was some call for that. It didn't get very far and it was firmly rejected by the government. So there are definite tensions because, you know, it would be a bad thing. Now, we saw the problems of recruiting people to the High Court. The High Court is under strength, significantly under strength. They can't get the judges. Um, and um, But they have got at least one very good recruit to the judiciary, um, who joined um, uh, uh, six weeks ago um, and who got his knighthood with the other judges last week. Um, and, you know, he is somebody who is very, very promising, um, somebody to, to tip for the top, only because he's 45 and therefore has plenty of time to make his way up the hierarchy. Um, and um, so there are, whereas there are worrying signs, people don't apply, there are good signs in that good people do apply. Um, and it's a balance. Uh, so I'm not particularly worried. I, I rather admire the, the flexibility of the common law, the flexibility of the uncodified constitution, and the ability of the different parts of the constitution to do what some people think of as rather radical things, but nevertheless 
to make up for the imbalance caused by other parts of the Constitution. The example, obviously, is the Supreme Court um, over, over the, uh, effectively de declaring the prorogation of Parliament as not to have happened. Um, and if you like, although this is more controversial, um, the Speaker allowing uh, legislation to be passed effectively by backbenchers telling the government what to do. Um, these are all things which are on the edge of the Constitution, but nevertheless... I think, um, are ways of the Constitution um, uh, trying to revert to the centre, uh, which is where it should be. I think, sort of get, harking back to the first um, Miller case, which generated the enemies of the people um, comment in the mail, I think at that point many people in the profession did feel at rock bottom um, yeah. that this was the public perception yeah. um, of one strand yeah. uh, of the profession. Um, and I know at the University of Law, we certainly sort of thought about it and wondered whether some of the blame could lie at our own door in that perhaps as a profession we had not promoted ourselves clearly enough to the public to retain that trust in us as professionals or whether, as other people said, it was the fault of Ms Truss, who was the then Lord Chancellor, who didn't respond and react um, by defending um, the High Court judges who'd made that decision. So do you think there's some somewhere in between there that or, or, or all roads sort of lead to the sort of the, the fall in status of the profession? Um, it's very, very difficult for the profession to persuade people who won't listen that lawyers are not fat cats. The Daily Mail at the time under Paul Dacre would not accept that at all um, and went out of its way to insult lawyers just as it insulted the judges. Uh, Dake is no longer editor, things have changed. Um, but if certain elements of the press are determined to push a myth, um, um, a trope, then it's very, very difficult to show otherwise. That's not to say you shouldn't try, I think you should try. I think you know lawyers should demonstrate as much as they can the pro bono work they do um, and the other work they do for um, the benefit of society. You know the city of London depends on a strong legal profession bringing in work from outside, um, and it's very good at trying to push that message. But you know it's very difficult for people to grasp that. So the more that institutions can do to persuade the public that lawyers are okay uh, and actually, you know, valuable uh, ways of generating funds and funds is good for the economy and the economy is good for us all and so on. You know, that's all good. Um, the problem, one problem with the judgment in the enemies of the people case in the High Court was that the judges didn't actually spell out that all that was required to resolve the problem that they appeared to have created was legislation. And as things looked at that time, it would not be difficult to get the legislation through, and indeed it was not difficult to get the legislation through. Now, they were handing to Parliament the opportunity to block Brexit, um, and maybe some of the judges secretly hoped that MPs would block Brexit. But the reality at the time was that MPs uh, felt the need to allow Brexit to go ahead, and it seemed inevitable to us, and this was certainly proved by the event, that the bill that the Prime Minister was required to bring in in order to trigger Brexit would be easily passed, and indeed it was. You know, we're talking about um, 2017. Things were different then. Um, and um, the judges didn't spell that out. Now, judges don't spell out the consequences of their judgments, but it was a bit of a missed opportunity. Whether that would have pers persuaded the newspapers to treat it differently, I don't know, but it might just have slightly changed the narrative. So, sure, the more one can do to explain all this sort of thing to the public, the better. So, as well as the, um, the, sort of the future of the Constitution and the, the freedom of the press, um, which you have, have, have covered so well in your writing um, and your broadcasting, what do you think are going to be the, the big issues um, for lawyers in the future? What are going to be the new hot topics? Um, I went to the uh, launch today, not very far from here, of a um, paper on um, 
uh, cyber assets and cryptocurrencies. Um, um, uh, have I got that right? Um, I must look yep. it up because it, it's. Um, I, I don't even. I do know what these words mean. But um, as Jeffrey Voss, Chancellor of the Chancery um, Division, um, said today, this paper is not for nerds. Um, it's actually um, for. Uh, real people, and um, this is something that is quite easy to understand without the, uh, the wet towel around your head if you actually apply yourself to it. Um, so I think that this is actually um, this is actually something where the UK, uh, England and Wales is ahead of all other jurisdictions, um, and it's something that is going to become increasingly important. Um, it's something that people ought to get to know and understand. Um, it's, it's very interesting. This is not, um, it's a very curious thing. This is, people who are interested in this, this topic, commissioning some lawyers who know about these things to put together a paper it, which sets out the question, which sets out to answer the question um, of whether um, these assets, um, uh, uh, crypto assets and smart contracts, that's what it is, crypto assets, whether crypto assets are property or not, and if so, can they be treated by, as property or not? Um, and um, the short answer is they can be treated as property, but you have to understand how they work and why they're property. And what this is, what this amounts to is showing that the common law can adapt much more readily to a new class of assets than civil law countries where you need legislation and codes to do so. And this is a way in which the um, jurisdiction here in the City of London and England and Wales generally hope to steal a march on foreign courts. Um, and um, all this sounds you know, extremely mysterious and, you know, we're a bit suspicious of Bitcoin um, and um, all the stuff that goes with these uh, public keys and ledgers and, and you know, all this stuff. Um, but it's terribly important and um I intend to, perhaps if I wasn't speaking to you tonight, I'd spend the evening reading through this paper, um, but I do recommend it online. It's, it is the future. Excellent. And so obviously looking um, to the audience now, uh, um, many of whom are sort of partway through their, their careers, what, what um, advice would you give to anyone sort of starting out now with a career in law, given the sort of opportunities that, that, you've, that you've had and the, and the serendipity in your career that you were talking about earlier, what would you, um, what would you advise them um, to do? Keep to the day job and don't try journalism because ju <laughs> journalism, journalism, as I've made, I hope, clear, um, is, uh, has relatively little future. That doesn't mean you can't write a bit in your spare time. Indeed, the skills of journalism are very useful to any lawyer, um, whether the lawyer is writing uh, opinions, letters, uh, articles, for um, websites, firm or chambers publish, uh, or whatever, um, you know, literacy skills um, are well worth developing. But in terms of making money out of it, no, um, stick to the day job. Um, uh, I mean, there is this whole issue of the fact that there are too many students facing too few jobs, um, and that, you know, Sadly, some students delude themselves into thinking that they're going to get training contracts and pupillages when they're not. Um, and this is all very sad. But um, um, I'm sure that the people here in the room are the cream of the cream. And um, some of you um, have, uh, you know, I mean, you all look terribly young to me, but you, some of you clearly are in practice already. Um, and, um, and therefore, um, you've already um, got the first step on the ladder. Um, but my impression is that although it wasn't easy for us, it's much harder now. I think that's right. Um, so, um, on a personal level, um, and I say this with a so far in front of it, so far, what do you think are your, sort of your greatest achievements? What are you most proud of? What would you put as your sort of top three things that you've done in your career to date that, that you, uh, you know, um, blush about a little? <laughs> Well, journalism um, is uh, involves a great deal of luck. Um, some of it you have to exploit the luck. Um, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a story from long ago when I was still 
being tried out as a reporter because I was a reporter for a couple of years before I was uh, a legal correspondent and before I was a reporter I was in the BBC terminology on attachment meaning I was being lent to the newsroom to see if I could crack it and um, I was driving home one evening um, through uh, West London and listening to the radio um, and um, at one minute to seven in the evening, there was a traffic alert saying that Earls Court was blocked, um, Earls Court Road was blocked, and um, at one minute past seven, there was a news report saying that there had been a shooting incident in Earls Court, um, but nobody knew what was going on, no de- there were no details at the moment. And I thought, well, I'm not very far away, um, I'm meant to be a reporter, I've got a tape recorder in my, the boot of my car, I'll go and have a look. So I went along there. And this incident had happened a couple of hours earlier. Um, and in the middle of the road, I don't think it's Earl's Court Road, but it's the adjoining one, there was a mini car uh, with its doors wide open in the middle of the road and no traffic. And, you know, it was a crime scene. Um, and um, it, uh, it turned out that um, the driver of the car had been shot by the police. This was fairly unusual. Um, And in the circumstances, um, uh, nobody was saying anything, but all the press were being told to go to the local police station in Earls Court Road um, by the police in order that they could be kept sitting there and told absolutely nothing at all. And um, I was working for radio, and um, uh, I looked around, and there was a block of flats overlooking the scene of the crime. And in one of the... And they had balconies. And in one of the balconies, I could see a television crew. It was winter, it was dark. And in those days, television crews consisted of camera operators, sound operators, and lighting operators. And there was a a chap with a battery light holding an arm like that with a light down showing... Uh, lighting the face of somebody who was being interviewed with her back to the scene of the crime. And there was a camera in the building. So it was very clear that this was on the third floor and that this was quite easy to find. So I went into the block of flats. It was easy enough to get in. Walked up to the third floor and um, just got to the flat where this woman had been interviewed just as the television crew were finished. Um, And um, I said to the woman, you've just done BBC television, do you mind doing it? interview for BBC Radio. She said, fine. So I interviewed her, and she said that she thought that she had seen the police surround a car and shoot the driver. Um, And I said, oh, that's very interesting. Thank you very much. And I um, um, uh, did the recording, rang the office, said I've got an interview with an eyewitness. They said, great, great, because we can't find anything, because our reporters stuck in the police station. They won't tell her anything. (laughs) Um, So I said, fine. Well, I'll drive back to Broadcasting House with the tape. Um, and uh, there it was, the, the first eyewitness radio um, uh, report suggesting that the police had shot this chap. Um, and um, they were terribly pleased because this was you know, the first inkling that something terrible had happened. The police had shot the wrong man. It was awful. Um, he recovered, but you know, he was shot. Um, and um, uh, you know, I had got this by following the television crew And the television crew had got this by um, taking advantage of the lighting operator who was the best journalist around and who had knocked on every door in this block of flats overlooking the scene of crime saying, anybody here speak English and did you see anything? You know, as you say in the the classic um, foreign affairs reporting, anybody see the scene of the crime? So this lighting person um, was the best journalist around. And after that, the BBC scrapped lighting people because they thought that, you know, you can stick a light on the camera and you don't need a lighting operator. But no, he was terrific, you know, and I owe my career to him. Oh, that's a wonderful story. Now, I'm very aware of time and I'm going to hand you over to the audience in a moment if they see if they've got any questions they want to ask you. But just one final question from me. And um, uh, obviously, it's a slightly uh, surreal moment for me to be interviewing a journalist. Um, so I'm going to ask you, what question would you <laughs> ask yourself that I haven't covered, uh, have covered this interview properly? <laughs> um, um, 
Mm, I think that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to pass. I think I'm going to say that I would get you to ask me whatever question it is that the first person from the audience is going to ask me. <laughs> Excellent response. Um, so if I can now um, hand over to the audience. I think we've got some, have we got some roving mics? I think that would be helpful if we had this so that everybody, could, everybody can hear the question. So I've got to ask, first of all, has anybody got um, a question? Yes, lots of hands. Hi. <laughs> um, I was really interested in the political aspects you were talking about with legal reporting recently, um, with the Brexit judgments. I work in civil liberties, which has often felt increasingly under scrutiny from the papers. Do you think that's getting worse, or is my naivety just disappearing as I do this for longer? Like, I'm thinking particularly of some of the um, Theresa May's comments when she was Prime Minister about, I think we were left-wing activists lunatics was the subtext um well i don't know if it's getting worse um it's certainly essential that campaign groups of all sorts make their voice heard i think you do have the advantage that first of all trust in politicians is going down uh, generally speaking and you know, I say that neutrally of all politicians. Um, secondly, opportunities for campaign groups to make their voices heard are getting greater all the time. Um, whereas a few years ago, an organisation like Liberty would have found it difficult to get reports into the newspapers, nowadays you don't need reports in the newspapers. You email your supporters... Um, you put things on your website, um, you do videos, you know, YouTube, all, all, all the stuff that you do in order to get your voice heard. Um, I spend, um, I, I, we haven't spoken about Twitter, for example, and I, I, get, I, I look to Twitter for a, a breaking news story. I also look to see whether somebody else has put the story out that I've got before I before I have, for example, the judgment from the court, um, because I try and provide a, a service to people by putting out uh, breaking stories. They may not be exclusive stories, but they are breaking stories, and um, I expect to see breaking stories on Twitter. Um, and you know, if Liberty wins a case, or even if it loses, I will expect to see a tweet or two or three summarising the result um, and linking me to. Um, a web page with the consequences. Um, so you have plenty of opportunities to get your views out. Um, and I don't think it's getting any worse. Um, I mean, it is a fact that the present government has said that it does not intend to repeal the Human Rights Act. Um, there has been a great deal of concern that that's the next thing on the present government's agenda. Um, but it has said that that's not what it proposes to do. It said that last week with the story about soldiers. Um, now, um, you may be concerned at the proposal to amend the Human Rights Act, but um, whether that will happen or not, we wait to see. But the government doesn't intend to repeal the Human Rights Act and does not intend to withdraw from the Human Rights Convention. Um, so, you know, that's one of the fears that organisations like Liberty have had, which appears to be unjustified. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't be vigilant. Of course you should. Um, but it's not quite as bad as it might be um, for all the reasons we know. You've touched on it with your new book title, but Enemies of the People was a big headline at the time. What do you think judges can do to be more public-facing and, and to get the public to understand what is a really complicated subject? My background before I started my training contract was child protection, and there's lots of Facebook groups for parents that are very angry about the work we do. But actually, on balance, the right decisions are made. But judges can't put their side of the story out there. The judgments are there, but that's not always enough. And child protection, you're referring to what was anything specifically? I mean, what you talk about private law cases? My background was care, yeah, but okay. anything kind All of right. baby well, pee and okay. onwards. Well, um, on the private law side, 
Um, I interviewed Andrew McFarlane, president of the family division, last week um, about a particular concern um, that we raised, which was um, uh, uh, domestic abuse in contact cases. Um, in other words, um, what should happen when parents split up and one parent, typically the father, doesn't have to be the father, is either suspected of or has been convicted of um, domestic abuse. Should that parent have contact with his typically child or not? Um, if you say yes, unsupervised contact, you may put the child at risk. If you say no contact, that's regarded as damaging to the child and the judges have to decide. And begin with, obviously, they have to look for evidence and to get evidence takes time, um, several months sometimes, and do you allow the uh, parent to see the child in the interim or not? And there's no easy answer. It's a very difficult question for judges to deal with. And McFarlane was very happy to be interviewed on this subject. He had various suggestions, nothing very extraordinary, um, but he did, you know, acknowledge this was a problem and that occasionally judges would get it wrong with tragic consequences. And we broadcast this on Law in Action last week and I wrote it up in the Law Society Gazette and the piece out today. Um, so um, they can talk about this sort of subject if they are given an opportunity to do so in a, a serious way to a serious audience. And they do, and they're willing to do so. Um, this despite the fact that we are meant to be in PERDA, and therefore everything is meant to be off limits. PERDA, of course, is you know, pending a general election. Governments aren't meant to say anything controversial. Um, uh, and they, the government, have gone to an all's lengths to try and uh, stop bodies for which they're responsible from doing anything remotely controversial. So the Law Commission, with which I have an association, wasn't even allowed to um, publish or publicise a lecture it had commissioned uh, from Lady Hale last week. I mean, it's, on, it's going to go on the judicial website, but not on the Law Commission website till after the election. It's quite extraordinary. But, but the judges, on the whole, are quite happy to, to talk. Um, and um, provided they're given an opportunity and provided it's taken seriously, um, it, it, it's all to the good. Um, it's, of course, very easy for newspapers to sensationalise this. And judges have got to be quite careful, but they are willing to talk. Uh, much more so than, um, as I was saying, when we started Law in Action all those years ago. One over there, if you like. Hi, good evening. Um, I guess my question is, um, with all the, the tension in terms of the political climate at the moment, do you feel that our checks and balance system, despite the fact that we don't have a, co a written constitution and we have, you know, enshrined principles, whether that check and balance system is under attack at the minute, just given in terms of what the government as the executive branch is willing to try to fudge almost its way in introducing various things, some of it that public aren't aware of, uh, and some of it as recent as the, what they try to do now. And thank God we have a, a sound judicial system that kind of checks them. But I'm just thinking in terms of the judiciary and the press, who are the pillars of checking and balance, whether they are coming under attack. Uh, you're right to be concerned. But I think, to some extent, you've answered the question, um, which is that the judiciary are alive to this and are willing to step in. Um, now, you know, whatever you think of the decision um, of the Supreme Court in the prorogation case, Miller Number 2, Stroke Cherry, and obviously it overturned the decision of the High Court of England and Wales, um, this did show that the judges were willing to step in um, and do so in a very persuasive way by you know, getting everybody to agree. This unanimous judgment carried great authority. Um, and the message was 
if you, Prime Minister, are going to go further than the unwritten conventions of the Constitution expect you to do, then we, the Supreme Court, will find a way of stopping you doing this. Um, I mean, this is fairly high-stakes stuff, but in another way, it's just what the courts do. And I spoke to one judge the following day who said, well, what was surprising about that decision? It's just judicial review, government exceeds its powers, and therefore it's told that its decision is void. And that's the basis of judicial review throughout. The fact that these were prerogative powers um, and that we'd never had a judgment in this area before didn't alter the fact that this was straightforward courts saying you can't do this. Now, if Parliament uh, wanted to, Parliament could take over the prerogative power, it could pass legislation saying the decision on dissolving Parliament is one for Parliament itself, not for the Prime Minister exercising prerogative powers on behalf of Her Majesty. Um, and then, of course, the courts would have to rule on that. I also mentioned um, the other side of the story, which um, was arguably more of a problem for the Prime Minister, which was the so-called Ben Act, the legislation um, which um, required him to ask the EU for the extension, which, of course, the EU granted, and we are where we are. So I prefer the flexibility of our uncodified constitution, which seems well able to uh, push against bulges in the system to block ministers who fail to follow conventions than I am than I would be with attempts to write a constitution which would take ages, which would be inflexible, which the government would hijack um, and wouldn't really deal with whatever problems are going to arise. I'm, I'm reasonably sanguine about the constitution provided the judiciary remains strong and provided parliament remains strong. Now, you could say that parliament is too strong um, and I've heard this said. Um, I gave a lecture a couple of weeks ago and somebody, a very distinguished lawyer, said surely Boris Johnson should have advised Her Majesty not to give royal assent to the Ben Bill, the bill that said um, that um, he had to ask for an extension. And I said, well, you would have had rioting on the streets. That would have been appalling. The last monarch to do that was Queen Anne. He said, well, I'm not sure, because he took the view that Parliament was there to endorse the government, to give uh, legislative support to the government, but ultimately the government was in charge. And I said, no, that's not how I read the Constitution. Um, the uh, sovereignty is with the Parliament. Parliament, sovereignty of Parliament involves the Commons, the Lords generally, and the Sovereign, and, uh, and, and, and uh, it's not for Parliament to say that it can tell, it's not for the government to take over that third power, the power of the sovereign, to assent to legislation. So I'm, I'm reasonably relaxed about it. I think the system will work itself out, but it's very interesting, and I can see why you're alarmed. It is alarming, but you just hope that, you know, um, there are enough people in power uh, to ensure that the powers that be do what they're meant to do. Our 60 minutes with Joshua are up um, and so I um, suggest that we conclude the event in terms of the Q&A but I'm sure Joshua will take questions um, after we, um, we finish this part of the um, event. But I really want to just say um, by way of conclusion a huge thank you to Joshua for giving up his time this evening to come to speak to us. I'm sure we've all learned an enormous amount from listening to what he has to say. I know I have and I'm scribbling notes furiously about the hard chairs and the, <laughs> and the over fast lectures um, as well as all the incredible insights about the constitution, the press and, and his own career. So I hope you'll join me in thanking Joshua enormously for being here with us.